Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron from Good Company, uh, and I'm here with Claudia, who I'll turn it over to in a moment. Um, but I will get things started today. Uh, we'll start with just a, a little introduction to Good Company, uh, who we are, what we do, why we're here. Um, and then uh, I'll do some greenhouse gas inventory 101, just to uh, describe some terms and some concepts and show some example results to set the stage for Claudia's part of the presentation, which, which is really the, the main part of the presentation today. And that's to introduce the live vineyard and winery GHG calculator. Uh, and and as, as Chris mentioned, uh, please use the chat to ask questions. We'll, we'll have two Q&A parts during the, the webinar. Uh, we'll, we'll pause after the GHG 101 piece and, and answer any questions. And then we'll have another Q&A at the very end after Claudia introduces the tool. So good company. Uh, we, we are a six person sustainability research and consulting firm in Eugene, Oregon. Um, we have been around since 2001. We help our clients measure, manage, and market their triple bottom line performance. Um, we, we do a lot of things in sustainability consulting, but one of the things we, we've done a lot of is greenhouse gas accounting for a wide variety of organizations and communities and, and products. Um, we also do a lot of work on climate action planning uh, for communities and organizations. We have clients uh, both in the public and private sector. Uh, in the public, we work for city and county governments. Uh, and in the private sector, um, we do work for, for a variety of folks, but uh, work with a lot of folks in the, in the food industry. You can see some of them here. Um, and it's really that combination of, of greenhouse gas accounting experience and, and our work in the food sector, which is why we were lucky enough to work with live on, on this project. All right, so we are here today to learn about greenhouse gas inventories and the tool we created to help you all do those. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how much experience any of you have with this. Um, so we wanted to start at the very beginning and, and what is a greenhouse gas inventory or GHG inventory or carbon footprint, all, all those things mean the same thing. Um, what it is, is it's a measurement of climate pollution for a specific boundary. Uh, so for this group, the boundary we're, we're talking about is, is the operations associated with your business, certainly on farm or on site emissions, but also emissions that happen uh, upstream and downstream of, of your operations that uh, are critical functions as part of your business. Um, what we're doing in an inventory is, is we're, we're collecting data um, to, to calculate emissions impacts. Um, e examples of the data include certainly fossil fuel use. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to be collecting data for gallons of diesel, gallons of gasoline, therms of natural gas. Uh, you're collecting information on electricity use. Uh, there'll also be information collected on material input. So weight of various packaging materials, maybe cardboard, glass, uh, also uh, land applied materials, fertilizers. Um, and then we'll also be collecting, collecting information on, on land use management. Um, both acres, uh, for in acres, um, acres of, of beneficial practices, uh, regenerative ag practices, so use of cover crops. Um, so, so this part can, can take into account benefits uh, that your operations are having in terms of storing additional carbon. Um, land use management might, might also have some impacts. Say if you converted a, a forest to cropland um, in the inventory period. Um, these are some examples of data. Claudia is gonna go through this more uh, as we get to her part of the presentation. Um, but this just gives you a flavor of kind of the information we're looking for as, as we do greenhouse gas inventories. Uh, once it's collected, uh, the, the, the data will be input into the tool uh, that Claudia is going to introduce. Um, so we take gallons of gasoline and we put it into the tool and it will, it will calculate the emissions associated um, with, with that impact. Uh, likewise, with benefits, the, the tool will also be able to calculate 
uh, additional carbon stored uh, based on land use practices. An inventory, ultimately an inventory results um, are, are used to focus, focus our attention and limited resources on on reducing impacts and increasing benefits. And, and that, is, that is the point of the tool. It is to highlight where your largest sources of, of fossil fuel emissions are, and, and then highlight some opportunities that you might have available to you as, as a steward of, of our land and natural resources. So what's being measured in an inventory? So uh, at, at the most basic, what an inventory is measuring is the weight of different greenhouse gases. Uh, there's a set of seven gases that's defined in greenhouse gas inventory protocol. Um, really four of them are, are most applicable to, to all organizations. It's the four you see listed here on the table. And what we're doing in an inventory is, is we're, we're calculating the weight of those different gases and we're converting them all into a common unit, which is metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. We do that using global warming potentials. Each of the gases has a different global warming potential. Um, so we take the weight of any gas and we multiply it by its GWP to get to metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So if you have one metric ton of carbon dioxide, uh, you multiply it by one to get one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. But if you have one metric ton of methane in your inventory, it gets multiplied by 28. So you get 28 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So if you've ever heard somebody talk about powerful greenhouse gases, this is, this is what they mean. Uh, different greenhouse gases have, have different impact potentials. Um, the first three gases on this table are the products of combustion of fossil fuels. Um, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Predominantly, when you, when you burn a gallon of gasoline, you're, you're getting mostly carbon dioxide, but, but you also get um, portions of these, these other emissions as well, the methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, other sources of methane for this group uh, could include waste you send to landfills. Uh, landfill, their, their primary greenhouse gas is methane. Uh, a source of nitrous oxide for this group might be um, application of nitrogen-based fertilizers uh, to your crops. And then hydrofluorocarbons are refrigerants uh, used in building and vehicle cooling systems or chillers. Uh, there are different kinds of refrigerants, which is why you see a range here from 12 to 12,000. Uh, some, some refrigerants have much lower G GWPs than, than others. So this is, this is what we're measuring in a greenhouse gas inventory, right? This is the impact. It is, it, is, it is the weight and the global warming potential of these different gases brought together in a common unit to, to report out in an apples to apples way. Uh, metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent might be a phrase you've never used before in your life, um, which is common. And so uh, uh, it's abstract. Um, and so I wanted to share a few equivalencies to help bring home what is one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, it's equal to you driving a passenger vehicle 2,500 miles. Uh, it's equal to about 10% of one home's energy use for a year. Uh, if you're into barbecuing, it's equal to 40 propane cylinders. Or it's also equal to the amount of carbon sequestered in one year's time by 1.2 acres of average US forest. If you're interested in what it looks like, uh, that's what this image shows. This is the volume at ground level for a metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. You can see it's, it's about the size of a single family home. Um, and I like this picture because you, you can almost imagine stacking these boxes on top of each other around the earth. And that's what's forming the insulating layer that is our climate change problem. Within greenhouse gas accounting and the protocols for it, um, there are different categories of emissions. Uh, they're called scopes, and Claudia will refer to these later, so I wanted to introduce you to them now. Um, this image is a famous one in greenhouse gas accounting. Up in the clouds there, you can see the seven different greenhouse gases that are included in, in inventories. And then below, you can see the different scope categories and the colors. Uh, scope one are direct emissions from your owned equipment, 
Uh, so for, for most folks, this would be um, emissions from combustion of gasoline or diesel in, from vehicles and equipment, combustion of natural gas in buildings. Uh, other sources of scope one emissions for this group might include nitrous oxide emissions uh, from fertilizer application. Uh, scope one emissions here could, could for this group could also include if there was significant land use change in the inventory year where you removed a forest to create cropland. Uh, that could also be a significant source of emissions. So that's scope one. These are direct emissions from the stuff you own. So you can think of these as, as your owned emissions. Um, scope two is electricity. Um, so th this is an indirect source of emissions. Uh, electricity is generated elsewhere, producing emissions, and then brought to you via lines. Um, Scope one and two are interesting as a group in that they are the basis for many climate goals for organizations and communities. Um, the, these, these are the boundaries folks most often use to set uh, climate goals. Um, and then scope three is, is everything else. And these are very much shared sources of emissions. So in scope three, we would have emission sources like the production of uh, cardboard or glass. Uh, that you might be using. These, these could also include if you contract for freight services, uh, that would be a scope three emission source or any waste you send to a landfill uh, would also be scope three. And these are shared. Th these are shared between you creating demand uh, for, for certain activities and your vendors who, who supply that demand. Um, these are different, you don't have direct control over 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 these emissions or, or how to manage them you're not you're not choosing the efficiency of their equipment you're not choosing the fuels that they're using to provide you with these services um, so you have less control um, and, and so why and so that that's the reason um, th these are separated out in, into a different category if you're wondering why why we look at scope three it's because these emissions are almost always the largest single category in an inventory and, and so because they're so large for, for most organizations and communities and households um, and because climate is such an urgent problem um, we include them to to highlight those sources um, and look for opportunities for emissions reductions there as well so all right so let's get into some results now um, so the, the first is uh, example results from uh, vineyards and wineries. This comes from a study looking at um, looking at uh, th these types of organizations in Spain and France. They looked at a, a, a wide variety of them and, and summarized the data here. And I show you this not because this is exactly what you will see in yours, but to start um, developing your intuition around what are the largest sources of emissions um, for, 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 um, for producing wine. Um, so you can see that the first one across the life cycle of, of, of wine is uh, glass production uh, for the bottles followed by a group of uh, land use, land application materials, both fertilizers and phytosanitary products. If you combine all these together, it, it adds up to a relatively large source of emissions. Then we have diesel uh, use at the vineyard, um, followed by energy use at the winery, diesel and electricity. And another significant source is, is fugitive emissions, refrigerants uh, at the winery. Um, so this is just, uh, Claudia will show you more uh, in the tool, um, but this is, is, is a general sense of scale between different emission sources um, in your business. And then for results, I, I also wanted to, to, to take a step back um, and, and show how food and beverage fits in um, into a community's emissions. Um, a lot of times with climate change, we can feel very small and alone and uh, you know, um, maybe think that what we do doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, so I, I wanted to, to put what you all do in the context of a community to show the scale of it. Um, 
So this is, these are community results for Bend, Oregon, the city of Bend, Oregon. Um, you, you can see that the bars here represent re representing emissions and metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. Stationary energy is buildings, and the green is transportation, so passenger vehicles and commercial vehicles. Waste is a mix of landfilled waste and wastewater treatment, and then the orange bar here is refrigerant loss. Um, you can think of, of these as sort of the scope one and two emissions for a community. Um, so let's start bringing in those scope three emissions now. So what these are, are um, emissions produced outside the community to, uh, to, to produce the, the materials imported into the community for final consumption. So we have goods here, household goods of various types, right? Home construction, clothing, furniture, and um, we've, we've added in upstream production for vehicle fuels and building fuels. Um, and then I want to add in uh, your, your industry, uh, household food and beverage. Um, and as a group, this food and beverage agriculture is, is large, right? It, it is comparable to on-road vehicles. It is comparable to, to residential energy use. Um, and so I, I just wanted to share this, right? It, wine obviously isn't responsible for all these emissions. But household food at a community level and, and beverage is, 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 is a big deal. Uh, and I just wanted to, to share that with you to help see what you do in, in a different context and the scale of it. Uh, this, is, this is another view of community emissions. This graphic is a lot like uh, what I just showed, except it's for Clackamas County, Oregon. So it's for the whole of Clackamas County. Uh, over on the left, we have those scope one and two emissions. And then in the middle, we, we have those scope three emissions from in, imported goods and food. Um, but what we added to this one uh, was a, a, a group of, of, of negative emissions. And, and really what this is representing is uh, the beneficial aspects of, of land use. And Clackamas County has a lot of forest land uh, that is sequestering carbon every year. Um, and it is significant um, and it, it is an opportunity. It can't ever replace needing to, to reduce our use on foss of fossil fuels and mitigate those emissions. Um, but it is certainly an, an opportunity uh, at the county scale and also for, for, for folks like you who, who are stewards of the land and, and have the opportunity to, um, to increase carbon storage on that land. Um, so I wanted to share this, and then I also wanted to share a little bit more detail and, and bring it closer to home for you all. Um, this, this is a graphic, and I know it's a lot to take in. It, it's a graphic from the National Academies of Sciences, and it shows different land use opportunities for climate action around the globe. Um, you can see over on the left different types of actions that could be taken for, for forests and ag. Um, the bars themselves represent the total sequestration potential around the globe. And then the different colors on these bars represent price points. So the light green are the least cost actions um, and the dark green are the highest cost actions. Um, so the ones related to what you all do uh, are certainly cover crops. Cover crops were found in this study to to represent the largest potential at the lowest cost uh, of any of these actions. We have cropland nutrient management, uh, also being a, a large, a large um, potential for, for low cost action. And then we, we also have avoided forest and grassland conversion. So I, I put this one on there for any of you out there who, who may have, uh, who may own a lot of land uh, and, and have forest or grassland on it that, that, that could be converted to cropland. And, um, you know, th this shows that the keeping that in place and keeping that carbon storage in place uh, is a relatively low cost way to, to uh, mitigate our climate change problem. And before I turn it over to Claudia, I, I just wanted to share a, a couple more resources besides the tool that, that you all can download. Um, the, these are compliments to it. Uh, the first is, uh, it's a written document. It's, it's a protocol um, 
for your industry from the International Organization of Vine and Wine. It was done in 2017. Um, we, we used it as we developed the tool um, and it, it just provides a written guidance on, on how to conduct an inventory. And then on land use specifically, USDA has, has a suite of tools that can be used related to land use. Um, th these tools, they, they don't calculate um, sources of emissions for your operations, but they do provide great detail related to benefits from, from different land use management practices. Um, and so uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Claudia. Uh, these are the two of us, in case you're wondering what we look like. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. I, I think we'll break right now and, and, and we'll do some questions and, and then Claudia will start her part of the presentation. Thank you, Aaron. I think we had one question come in um, asking if we know the negative impact of farming vineyard and storing carbon in the vine and in the grapes. So we do have uh, that as part of the inventory tool and I'll be showing you uh, shortly what that looks like and how you can calculate what's stored in, in your vines among other uh, parts of your farm. If you have any other questions, please enter them into the chat window and we'll be happy to answer them before we move on. Claudia and Aaron, this is Chris. Um, someone asked if we're gonna share the PowerPoint and I, I mentioned that we're gonna record this presentation, but would it be okay to share the actual file, the PowerPoint file with them? Uh, uh, of course, ha yes, of course, happy to do so, yes. And, and on the, the carbon storage in the vine question, I would sort of uh, redirect you to the, the recorded presentation that our colleague Justin did on regenerative ag too. I, I know he has a slide uh, related to, to carbon storage at vineyards in that presentation. All right, I don't see any other questions for now. So I think we can move into the presentation of the tool itself. Uh, again, if you do have questions, enter them into the chat window and we'll have another Q&A after the tool presentation. All right, Aaron, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, I'll start sharing mine. All right, I stopped sharing. Thank you. Okay, I hope everyone is able to see um, the instructions, the initial screen of the GHG inventory workbook. So this is what we are referring to as the tool. So you can see lots of sheets at the bottom of this tool. Do not let it intimidate you because you likely won't have to use all of them. So I'm gonna introduce each tab of the workbook show you how it works, show you what you need to know uh, and how to complete your inventory. Um, I want to run through the instructions with you first. So again, we're gonna be measuring uh, GHG emissions and it's gonna be sorted into different buckets, including scope one, scope two and scope three emissions that Aaron went over. Um, as per protocol generally says, scope one and scope two um, emissions are required for your inventory. They include, again, those fuels um, and emissions that happen on site. So stationary combustion of fuel, mobile combustion of fuel, which is a fancy way of seeing vehicles, refrigerants from buildings and other um, refrigerant applications, land applications and management if you have a vineyard and purchased electricity and scope three emissions are not required, but they're highly recommended to get a much better picture of what your total emissions look like. And this includes packaging materials, business travel, freight transport, and offsite waste. At the end of this, you'll see um, a final report of all your emissions that will be shown here on the far right. So what do you need to know to fill out this tool? Um, Everything that you need to enter data into has this turquoise color. There are some white cells as well. That means they're optional. As I believe we mentioned earlier, this inventory is useful for both wineries and vineyards. So the 
previous version of this tool was only usable for, for wineries. We've expanded it with new sections for vineyards. Um, and obviously you don't have the same types of emissions from those two different types. So if you're a winery, you wanna focus on certain aspects, including packaging, freight, things like that. If you're a vineyard, you're gonna to wanna to focus a little more on land management, uh, land applications, things that have to do with the land. You probably don't even have packaging materials. Um, and as a note here, whenever you have data available for the whole farm, uh, please use that data. If you don't have it for the whole farm, it is okay to use data specific to the vineyard. When you use this tool, you wanna to make sure to read the introductory text for each emissions category. It will probably help you do it easier and faster. You wanna save and organize all of your records to facilitate the verification process and to make it easier for you to enter this data when you're ready. We want you to know that estimates are okay. You're not always going to have exact figures. It is nearly impossible to get exact figures. You just wanna get as close as possible um, given the amount of effort and time that you have available and resources. If you use a, a management company for your vineyard or, or winery, um, you're going to want to focus on the data collection for the actual site, uh, the, the actual client, and then you want to submit your completed workbook to live. We're moving on to the general tab. So this is the first tab you will use to enter information about your vineyard or winery. So you want to enter your name, you want to enter the report year, you want to enter what kind of processes, and I've filled in some sample numbers throughout this workbook to make it go a little bit faster and easier. So if you are a winery, you want to look at total annual production in cases. Um, you want to look at total uh, acres of vineyard and property, and you want to look at total short tons of fruit produced. You also want to fill out information about your electric and natural gas utilities and if you use any renewable energy or green or offset purchase programs. So the first tab here is the stationary combustion. So this is anything that uses any sort of fuel, so other than electricity, but that stays in one place. The most common type here is natural gas, um, but you'll also see below that any sort of liquid fuels like gasoline, diesel, biodiesel renewable, other oils, oil-based, and even wood and wood waste. So starting here, I, pay, I place some uh, just sample numbers into natural gas. And so again, the turquoise cells are where you're gonna want to enter data for your vineyard or winery. And then at the right side here, it will calculate the emissions for you. So um, throughout the year, I, I just put in some numbers for the winter months. You can see here a total of 750 therms. That's roughly equal equivalent to four metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So again, um, if you're struggling to remember what kind of these terms mean, you'll be able to go back to that PowerPoint that we shared earlier. So if you're trying to remember what metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent is, um, you can go there for some resources. You can also enter if you um, purchased any sort of offsets, um, i.e. Uh, kind of smart energy programs from your natural gas provider. You can put in by percentage of your bill here, or you could put in therm equivalents depending on how your utility offers offsets. So you can see that um, it's four tons of emissions, but if you do uh, roughly 100%, let's see, roughly half um, offset, so just under three tons of that, uh, was offset through smart energy purchases. You also want to enter any other fuels that you use other than natural gas. And again, I would just place some sample numbers, five gallons a month uh, for, for various fuel types. And you'll see those um, calculated as a subtotal over here. One thing we did not go over in the PowerPoint presentation is biogenic emissions. So if you think of these emissions as being on the long-term um, carbon cycle, you know, 
uh, fossil fuels that are dug up from the ground from a long time ago. And there'll be a long time before they are sequestered into the ground or plants or whatnot again. Uh, these are more on that short term cycle. Um, so they're not considered part of your uh, GHG inventory, but they are of interest. Um, you'll also be able to enter any other fossil fuels that are less common. You can select them from the drop down. So um, you can use uh, butane, ethane, other various kind of specialty fuels, but these are the most common up here. So you'll be entering data here. It will spit out a figure here, and at the top, it will total both your category emissions and your purchased offsets. Um, nice and neat for you up at the top. Moving on to mobile combustion. So this is vehicles and equipment, so probably of particular interest if you are a vineyard or any sort of operation with um, larger equipment um, that you drive a lot. So I've entered some sample numbers here for um, most common fuel types. So there's two different ways of entering mobile combustion data. You can either enter it by fuel use in gallons, if you have that readily available. You can also enter it by mileage of on-road vehicles, you know, so just look at your odometer of your vehicle, or hours if you have non-road vehicles, so tractors, ATVs, etc. So I've entered some sample numbers here. You'll see, um, you can just enter your total gallons for the year. Um, so these, this would be if you save your receipts, if you do any sort of bulk purchases, um, it'd probably be easiest to enter by gallons. This is pretty convenient way of doing it. You'll have your emissions here and your biogenic emissions right next to it. And again, populates up at the top automatically. This is a very large number, but again, these are just sample data that we're entering. Um, you can also see, um, let's just show what it looks like, 500 gallons of each fuel. You can see how um, some fuels are uh, a lot lower emission or higher emission than others. Um, so if you're curious, this would be a great place to kind of play around with. Um, if you're thinking of switching to a different fuel for the next year, um, you can look at the differences in emissions and might be able to, to choose a smarter fuel type for next year. Um, for example, you can see um, these are the different diesel types. So 500 gallons of pure motor diesel versus B5, which is the Oregon standard blend of 5% biodiesel versus R99, which is a 99% renewable diesel. You can see there's a huge difference here in emissions for the same quantity of fuel. If you don't have data by gallons, you again can uh, enter data for, for use. Um, so for example, if you have a, uh, an on-farm pickup, you can enter that here, maybe uses gasoline, it gets 20 miles to the gallon, and you've driven it 10,000 miles and it shows your figure here. And then if you have uh, non-road vehicles like tractors, you can write tractor one, you can write blue tractor, for example. So heavy duty equipment here, I entered one as using biodiesel and another as using R99 renewable diesel, 500 hours each you can see there's a distinct difference in emissions for those different fuel types, even if they're used the same amount. You can also enter smaller, uh, smaller equipment like ATVs. Again, I'm just putting in sample numbers and it shows you here the emissions based on that. I'm going to clear some of this out because I'm actually going to show you the results later on in the report. Let's move on to uh, refrigerants. So I think the first two are pretty familiar to folks, stationary and mobile combustion, maybe not in those terms, but vehicles, uh, cars and equipment, heaters, boilers, natural gas heating, um, those are pretty familiar things. 
refrigerants you may be less familiar with, but you use them pretty often uh, without thinking about it. So a lot of refrigerant equipment, uh, I'll scroll down to show you, uh, refrigeration, commercial, um, transportation refrigeration, really you probably only have a handful of pieces of equipment like chillers and air conditioners and refriger refrigerators. If you know, um, let me back up just a moment. So uh, these are the different equipment types. You, generally speaking, um, want to be entering data here uh, if you are buying new equipment or if your equipment is being serviced and recharged with new refrigerant that has leaked previously, um, or if uh, you are um, getting rid of a refrigerator or something similar. Um, another small uh, thing that comes up often is um, fire extinguishers. They also use refrigerants. So you, if you have the, the weight of the refrigerant available to you, that's the very easy way of doing it. You can ask your HVAC um, maintenance uh, person to provide you with the details of what kind of refrigerant they, they recharge your equipment with and the, the total weight of it. So I've entered three different refrigerants here, 10 pounds each. And as Aaron mentioned earlier, refrigerants have very different uh, global warming potentials. And you can see that illustrated here. Um, again, 10 pounds, the so same quantity of three different refrigerant types with very different uh, emissions uh, coming from that refrigerant. You can also enter um, by number of pieces of equipment. If you're not sure uh, how many pounds of refrigerant you're using, um, you can enter, I'll do a sample here, refrigerator one. You'll enter the capacity of the refrigerant. You'll enter the type of refrigerant that you used. Uh, if it was installed or recharged on site this year. So most equipment is not new, but we'll pretend that this one is new and maybe you used it instead of the default 12 months, you installed it in April and had it for eight months. And that um, shows you the, the leakage of, of your equipment. Even if you haven't maintained it, it's pretty common for there to be a standard amount that leaks out every year. So you can see, even though we entered a um, pretty significant amount of refrigerant here, this is a large number, uh, but again, it's sample numbers, and um, it may or may not be important for your particular operation. It varies, definitely. Let's move on to land applications. So this one is gonna be of particular interest for um, vineyards. Um, or winery vineyard combination. So again, as Aaron showed in his uh, presentation, um, land applications have pretty significant potential to um, be both beneficial and problematic for in terms of a greenhouse gas inventory. So there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, we're gonna go through first with the regenerative activities and inputs. So I've entered again sample numbers here. Um, you're want, you want to enter first cover and beneficial soil amendments. This includes mulch, animal derived amendments, compost, biochar. Um, so I've entered a sample of 10 to 15 acres. Um, a lot of questions that we had during the pilot is um, what if I only do between rows or every other row, similar, sim uh, different things like that. So if you have 15 acres that you mulched and you covered every other row, you can enter 50%. If you covered all 15 acres, you can change it to 100%. And you can see how this figure here changes to keep up with that. Um, so mulch, animal derivative amendments, compost, and biochar are all beneficial for your land to uh, sequester as much carbon as possible. So these figures are all negative. That means that they are having a good impact on your emissions. You can see they're summed up here. You'll have your emissions and your sequestration. 
but also fertilizers and pesticides are pretty uh, significant uh, on-farm uh, sources of emissions. Um, so we have some sample data here for fertilizers and pesticides. And uh, to, to be fair here, I am not uh, a farmer. I am a uh, <laughs> GHG calculator specialist. Um, so I've entered just some sample numbers here that I thought would be reasonable um, so you might not do the same type of thing for all acres on your farm. You might do 15 acres of one type, 10 acres of another. I've entered some sample numbers. You want to go first with the number of acres, then with the number of pounds of nitrogen per acre, and then you want to write down uh, how many times you did that per, uh, this year. And again, it will give you a subtotal. Um, at the end here. So this is another place where you can see if you're planning ahead for future years where emissions, um, what improvements you can make. These are all the same uh, amount of nitrogen and you can see that there's a difference in emissions uh, for each type. So nitrogen solution has a higher emissions uh, total than anhydrous ammonia or urea. Also, uh, pesticides can be pretty significant depending on how much you use. Um, you can enter this either by weight or by uh, liquid ounces. So again, put in some sample numbers. Um, hopefully you're not using this much. I'm not sure what's, what's reasonable for different farm sizes, but um, you can see the emissions here. And it, again, it's all rolled up into the top figure. This is one where, again, I would say you want to spend some more time making sure that this one is accurate. It's one of the newer pieces of the tool. It's going to be important for vineyards and can it, um, be a pretty significant change year to year, uh, depending on your practices. So you may not be able to choose how much electricity you use one year to another, but you can choose if you're buying renewable energy. And you may not be able to choose um, how much you need to drive your tractor around, but you can choose your fuel. And here you may not be able to choose how many acres of vineyard you have, but you can choose um, different things that you do with it. So again, scope one emissions are all about the choices that you make on site. Moving on to land management. Um, so the previous one was all about what you did to the land, things that you applied to the land and vines. Um, this one is what you're doing with the land itself. So this has a, a large impact on what emissions you create from tilling or what emissions you are, what uh, amount of carbon you might be sequestering from good regenerative practices. So the first thing you want to do here is select your climate region. This is largely based on if you are a wet or dry region per the USDA. I'm gonna select a wet region You'll see some sample regions here. Um, one may not fit you specifically, but I think it should be easier to know um, if, if you get a lot of rain and humidity or not. So first up here is tillage. So if you don't till at all, maybe you have 10 acres of no tilling, uh, there's no emissions associated with that. But if you do some light tillage or um, more than just once per year or between rows, um, it can add up pretty quickly. Let's do comparable figures here. So 20 acres of light tillage um, versus um, heavier tillage more than once per year. Um, it's more than uh, double. It's almost triple the emissions from um, doing a heavier till more than, more than once per year usually. So that has um, a large impact on your emissions from the soil. So this is largely the, the, these emissions are coming from the soil itself. There's also a permanent land use change. So a lot of folks ask questions about how much carbon is sequestered in my vines, in my bushes, in my plants, in the soil. Um, and the answer to that depends. Um, in terms of greenhouse gas accounting, uh, you only want to take uh, credit for the uh, 
incremental increase of uh, carbon that is being sequestered by your plants. Um, and that's what this is uh, covering right here. Um, so I did some samples of um, acreages uh, with different land use changes to see what you are gaining or losing in carbon um, from doing different uh, things to your land. So if you are going from no cover crop to a seasonal cover crop, and you have, you're doing that with five acres of your land, for this inventory year, you are storing almost two tons of carbon. So again, this goes up quite significantly if you have more acres that you are converting. Um, if you go from cropland to pasture or hay, if you go from cropland to permanent vegetative cover, um, barriers, buffers, any sort of ecological protection zone, that is also beneficial. So I can show you what that might look like. Um, and if you have some extra land that you're not sure what you want to do with it, this is a great way to see uh, what beneficial impacts you can have in terms of sequestering carbon. Um, of course, that is not the only thing we do. Sometimes we take forests down, we take shrubs down, we um, might make cropland uh, from that. And different things, um, in terms of a GHG inventory, there's a big difference between if you are composting, chipping, or repurposing um, that debris versus if you are burning it in a slash pile. You can see um, just one acre of conversion um, has a pretty significant impact already, even if you're composting or chipping the material. And it has a much more significant impact if you are burning that debris. It releases the carbon all at once. It is not considered part of the natural cycle. Um, so if you're considering making some changes to your land, uh, this is a great place to look at what that might mean. Um, not just now, but for 20 years. So in terms of protocol, you want to look at everything you've done to your land in the last 20 years. And then you want to list only permanent changes, not crop rotations, seasonal variations, um, anything like that. All right, moving on to the more popular question of how much carbon dioxide is stored in my land, not just what you can take incremental credit for in your inventory, but what is actually being held in your vines, in your soil, in your trees. Um, and we have some answers for you. Uh, so you can enter the number of acres of vineyard, most specifically, but you can also enter a number of acres of non-vineyard crops and seasonal plantings, trees and shrubs that are forest, uh, non-forest ecological protection zones, grazing land, and disturbed land. So um, if you have 25 acres of vineyard, almost 25 metric tons of carbon dioxide is being stored in that land. Um, so that's a great benefit. Um, I've had a lot of questions in the pilot on if the distance between rows matter and looking into it. Um, generally speaking, no. Distance between rows do not matter. The size of your vines is kind of negligible as well. Young plants, old plants, it's really all about the fact that you have vines growing in the soil as most of the storage is in the soil. So you can play around with this. Um, it's really interesting to see. You can compare vineyard to non-vineyard. So vineyard does hold more uh, carbon than most other non-vineyard crops and seasonal plantings. We can kind of show if you had 25 acres of everything, you can see that um, forest holds the most carbon Non-forest ecological protection zone uh, holds a lot. Vineyard not far behind. So again, um, if you are a vineyard, if you are a farm, you're going to want to spend a lot of time here to um, not only uh, get data entered for the inventory, but to get a good under understanding of your land and the different impacts uh, it can have on your GHG inventory and just the community in general. Moving on to electricity. So this is the scope to emissions. We have it here in green. These are all color coded. Um, purchased electricity is pretty simple. Um, you want to start with showing if you purchase renewable energy credits. Um, if you purchase green energy, 
um, if you produce solar, you can also enter that here. Let's say you produce a little bit of solar um, every month that, and that is sent to the grid um, that creates an impact for you. It's, uh, so again, negative numbers are good. That means you are sequestering carbon or helping someone else too. But really what you want to see um, here is the purchase electricity uh, in kilowatt hours. So this is something you would pull up your electric utility bill uh, documents for. Um, I've entered in some, just some sample numbers um, to see. Um, so a thousand kilowatt hours of electricity purchased every month is about three and a half metric tons. But if you um, buy renewable energy credits for about half, and then you send a little bit of solar, you can see that more than half of that is being um, uh, netted out by the renewable energy credits. So again, your emissions here, but also your uh, renewable energy credits. This is one that I think is gonna be easy and important for um, any operation, no matter if you're a vineyard or winery. Moving on to scope three emissions, we have packaging materials. So again, not every tab is gonna be useful for um, every person or every operation, every business. Um, but packaging materials is probably really important if you're doing any sort of bottling, if you're a winery in particular. Um, so again, we talked about glass being pretty significant, but we also have a cardboard calculator as well. So I have a sample number of 1,000 pounds of cardboard. You can see the emissions associated with that. But um, I think we want to get into the uh, emissions from glass bottles a little bit more. So I've created some samples here um, for you. We have a list of um, various bottle types from, um, that, that folks are using. Um, it's not a perfect list. It is um, as many as we were able to understand that folks use, but it's not your only option. But if you use these bottle types, the drop down makes it very convenient for you. It will automatically fill in how much uh, the bottle weighs. So this is automatically populated. You want to enter how many number of bottles in a case. I know there's usually 12, but sometimes perhaps there are large bottles and there are six. You want to enter the number of cases you purchase. You want to enter if you know the recycled content. You want to enter where the um, glass is produced from, shipped from, which you don't always know. There is also an other and unknown average option. And you want to enter the shipping method. It's pretty um, important here to get the correct shipping method if you know it. But again, there's a combination or average. If we um, look here at the top, you can see that different bottle types um, have different impacts. So typical glass bottles, there's a larger carbon footprint. If you have a lighter weight, it doesn't have to be smaller, um, but if you have a lighter weight glass bottle for the same volume, you generally save about 15% of emissions. Plastic bottles are about half of that of glass bottles. Aseptic cartons, refillable glass bottles that you use um, more than 15 times, these all have smaller footprints. They're significantly less carbon intensive um, as glass is quite carbon intensive to produce. It has great benefits in other ways. It's recyclable, it can be recycled, but the amount of energy it takes to produce the glass bottles and ship those glass bottles sometimes halfway around the world can be pretty significant. So we have separated out the shipping emissions from the glass production emissions, but here you can see the total emissions at the end. Um, so again, I have five different bottle types. I assume the same quantity of wine, so it's cases of 12 or six for this larger bottle type. Um, same number of cases. I kind of uh, sh wanted to showcase a little bit of different recycled content, different uh, regions that the glass is coming from, and try to match the shipping method to the region it's coming from. So you can see um, glass bottles vary a lot. Um, if you don't use any of the bottle types in the drop-down menu, you can also use this custom or other 
um, section where you can weigh your individual bottle in grams and enter it here. And then uh, enter just as above, you want to enter the number of cases, uh, number of bottles in a case, number of cases, if you know the recycled content, the shipping origin, and the shipping method, you'll be able to see um, any type of bottle. Um, you just need to know the weight, um, what the emissions are associated with that. So just for fun, we're gonna compare these two different custom bottles. So if they both weigh a thousand grams, that's a pretty hefty bottle, I admit, um, one kilo of glass in that bottle. Um, you can see that the emissions are pretty different and you'll see that it's primarily due to the shipping. If you are shipping from somewhere far away, it's gonna um, have a very large impact as glass is very heavy. Um, ocean freight, believe it or not, is um, a quite efficient way of shipping heavy things. Um, so for glass and cardboard, again, your total will be up here. This is highly recommended if you uh, have any sort of bottling process as the emissions here can be significant. Um, but moving on now to uh, business travel, this is another scope three. Um, here you can actually see um, the different travel emissions. This is by passenger mile. But um, you can see here that air travel by mile is um, much more energy intensive than other transit uh, travel types. So going by bus is the most efficient, transit rail, commuter rail. And you want to enter your um, business travel. So this is any sort of contracted, rented, or ticketed travel. These are not your owned vehicles, but if you have a business trip or you have a rental car, if you have a business trip where you're flying on an airplane, anything like that, this is where you would enter this uh, data. So just enter some sample numbers again, 100 miles in a passenger car, maybe you are um, taking a taxi or renting a car. Light duty truck, inner city rail, air travel, and you can see the emissions associated here. So you just want to enter the number of miles you traveled by month, and it does the rest of the work for you. Um, if you are a vineyard management company and you do travel on behalf of multiple uh, members and you want to calculate out um, how much travel should be associated with that particular vineyard, um, you can enter that data here. Um, what you want to do is enter acres managed for the live member total number of acres that you manage for all live members or um, or non-live members and you want to enter the total annual travel in miles so if this vineyard that you're filling out the workbook for um, has 25 acres that you manage but you ma manage a total of 100 acres for folks and you travel 10,000 miles that year 2,500 um, miles would be um, the responsibility of this particular vineyard. So you'd want to enter, you'd want to make sure that the year end total um, for that, um, for this particular workbook is 2,500. So that's just a little tool that you can use. Um, it's not required. It's not applicable to everyone. Um, moving on to freight transport. So this is for any sort of shipping that you might do. Um, it doesn't matter what's being shipped, if it's wine, if it's bottles, um, any sort of thing that you're shipping um, can be entered here. And I have some sample numbers um, entered already. So for example, if you are, let me back up a moment. So there are two different ways to measure freight emissions. Um, you can measure by ton miles or you can measure, uh, you can uh, calculate by passenger miles. So passenger miles are regular vehicles. If you're delivering something in your own vehicle, if you're delivering something in a pickup um, passenger car, those would all be passenger miles. 
Um, but a lot of uh, specially contracted freight uh, like FedEx, UPS, post office um, is um, calculated by ton miles. So a ton mile is one ton of product being shipped for one mile. If you have uh, one ton of product being shipped for 500 miles, that is 500 ton miles. So um, there's uh, those two different methods. So here I have a sample for vehicle miles. You can use this drop down vehicle miles of product um, being sent by a medium or heavy duty truck for 500 miles. It will calculate the emissions associated with that. Or if you have uh, figures for ton miles of product being shipped by medium or heavy duty truck, let's say there are, you have two tons that are being shipped for 500 miles. So that would be a thousand ton miles. Um, so here are the two tons. It would calculate the emissions associated with that. And one thing I wanted to show you here is the difference between uh, different transport types. So medium and heavy duty truck, 0.37 metric tons of CO2e, rail, uh, 0.04, so quite a bit smaller. Waterborne craft, so ocean freight, 0.11, and aircraft, 2.39. So there is a significant difference in emissions from um, the different shipping types. So aircraft, waterborne, ocean freight, um, rail, medium and heavy duty truck, you can see there's a big difference in, in how you choose to ship. So um, this could again help inform your decisions for a future year, hopefully it does. You can see what your options are. So you can feel free to play around with this um, to see what um, benefits you could potentially uh, make for your following inventory years. Moving on to off-site waste. So this is anything that you're sending into the waste stream or recycling stream. Um, so again, I just have some sample numbers here, pounds of waste being sent to the landfill. Um, I just entered a straight 500 pounds per month. It varies, of course, and it gives you a subtotal and your annual total. Um, so these emissions are generally pretty small. Um, it's less important perhaps than filling out other pieces, but maybe one of the easier things for you to fill out. And so that is all for scope three emissions. And now I'd like to show you the report tab. So this is the, the most important sheet you're gonna wanna look at when you're done with your inventory, because um, it shows you where, um, where your emissions are coming from, what things are problems, what things you are doing well, what things you can do better. It also has your total emissions. It has uh, a breakdown of scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. It shows you biogenic emissions, again, part of the natural carbon cycle, your carbon sequestration from your on-farm activities, and your credits and offsets from buying things like renewable energy or smart energy. It also has intensity metrics that you can use to um, benchmark your year-to-year -year emissions or compare to other uh, wineries or vineyards. So again, um, if you enter into the general tab, your number of cases of wine that you're producing, um, number of acres in, in your vineyard, your farm, and your amount of ton of fruit produced, it can show you your uh, tons of emissions per case, per acre, per ton. Um, so this is something that's really interesting if you like to benchmark um, year to year how you're doing. Um, so even if your um, vineyard grows or gets smaller, even if you're producing more or less fruit or bottles of wine, um, you'll be able to compare apples to apples using this metric. Um, you'll also be able to see a breakdown of emissions by category. So for each sheet, there is a separate row and you'll see both your total emissions and your sequestration offset or credits here. So you'll be able to see where your highest impact is. Um, again, these are sample numbers, but land management, it's likely that um, that's where a lot of your emissions might be coming from, but also a lot of benefits. So there's a lot of opportunity there. 
And then last but not least, um, scrolling over to the right, you will be able to see a, um, a graphic representation of your emissions. So maybe these numbers don't mean much to you. It's hard to visualize. You'll be able to see here um, at this table um, where your emissions are coming from. And that way you might be able to make a targeted action plan for how to reduce emissions from that sheet. Last but not least, we also have a, a graphic. I know Aaron showed you a bar chart earlier with um, some data from Western Europe um, where emissions might be coming from for um, agriculture. This one is specific to uh, vineyard and winery. And this is from a study here in Oregon, I believe. There's more information here below. Um, so this is a sample uh, an average based on a study of a number of vineyards of where your emissions are coming from, from the vineyard, from the winery, from packaging, and from transport. So um, this uh, largely depends on your inputs. It varies farm to farm, um, vineyard to vineyard, winery to winery, but this is a, a great way to see where your emissions are likely to be coming from and how you might compare to an Oregon average. All right, let me get back to um, view uh, questions that might be coming up. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, actually, I don't want to stop sharing my screen, but um, I think now might be a good time uh, to answer some questions in the Q&A. Uh, Claudia, this is this is Aaron. Uh, we have one question so far, um, and Great. that is um, within the and I'm going to paraphrase this a bit. Um, is are grapes included in the the carbon sequestration calculations for vineyards in the factor that is being used? Great question. So. Um, what I found was that roughly. Um, Roughly 90% of the carbon that's being stored on a vineyard is from the soil, uh, roots, um, all that whole, that whole beneficial system going on underneath the ground. So I think grapes are included, but they are a very small portion. And in terms of your net gain and net loss per year, it's, it's relatively insignificant. Um, so while I do think technically it is baked in, uh, grapes are, are very minor in terms of carbon specifically. All right, thank you. Um, if anybody else has any questions, please, uh, please, please put them in chat now. And we'll wait a little while for some more questions, but Chris, uh, you, um, if, if you could maybe start to get set for uh, some closing thoughts and uh, to close us out of the session. Sure. Um, there was a private question to me asking about whether or not this is going to be required of our members. Um, and the answer to that is we don't really know quite yet how we're going to include this into our standard, other than it'll just be um, for members to kind of use this year as a um, as a test. And then next year, we'll take the data and decide if we want to include it the way we do with the, um, the winery one, where we require scopes one and two, and then give a bonus point for scope three. Um, and we'll decide whether it's going to be required annually or periodically every few years. Um, it really depends on, you know, how the, how the board and the technical committees decide we want to use this pr the particular tool and how much time it takes for our members to do it and what the benefit is from doing it, you know, annually versus every three years or five years or something like that. Um, so that's the answer to that question, if anyone was wondering. And then somebody else actually commented with a credit on the chart from the CSWA, the California Sustainable Wine Association, um, their, their Wine Institute's Carbon Footprint Study of California Wineries and Vineyards. So we want to give that proper credit as well. 
Great. Yeah. And I do see um, a question associated with that too. How long do you anticipate the tool to take to complete for a smaller, smaller vineyard? Uh, I think that is a very great question. Something I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, it depends largely on number one, what kind of activities are going on on your farm, on your vineyard, on your winery. Um, but mostly it depends on how organized you are throughout the year. Um, if you're saving all of your receipts related to your fuel purchases, if all of your utility bills are in one place, if you are entering all this data on a monthly basis into an Excel spreadsheet, all of that will make it easier to, um, to fill out this workbook. So in terms of how much time it takes to fill in the workbook, I would say it technically only takes five to 10 minutes, um, maybe less as you get used to it, of filling out information per sheet. Um, but what you're gonna be spending your time on it really is, is the data gathering. If you have everything in front of you, it should be very easy. I would guess maybe half an hour to 45 minutes if it's going fast. Um, but if you have to hunt down every piece of information as you come across it in the workbook, it's gonna take you a longer time. If you have to go out to your tractor to check the hours reading, if you have to go out to check your odometer for your pickup, um, all of that takes time. If you have to log into your utility provider to get your last 12 months of bills, that's gonna take time. Um, so really, um, if you plan ahead and um, have everything organized on a monthly basis for the end of the year, when whatever this report might be due for live, um, that will make your life easier. So in terms of filling it out, not very long. Data collection, if you, if you set yourself up for a path of organization, it should be pretty easy. It looks like there's some follow-up on the question about the carbon from fermentation and um, just mm -hmm. my understanding of that is that it's part of the natural carbon cycle so it's 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 a it's in the wash because um what you're what it's giving off during fermentation is being sequestered in the next year's crop is that that's what i was told a few years ago about that particular question so there it actually that would be my answer as well yeah. Yeah. Um, but Aaron, I would definitely invite you to comment on that answer. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you. I think um, the, the grapes the grapes grow every year and um, either either are used in a product and that product is consumed and and so that that carbon is is coming back out of of whoever consumed it in one form or another um, or, or those grapes maybe. Um, Aren't, aren't usable and, and decompose, uh, releasing that carbon back to the atmosphere. Um, but it's happening on, on roughly an, an annual basis, like leaves falling from the tree. It's, it's part of the planet breathing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's helpful to think about this in terms of the short-term cycle versus the long-term cycle. So planet breathing is the short-term cycle, putting things in the ground, planting things that are permanent. Those are part of the long-term cycle. And a GHG inventory, really, you're, you're measuring the long-term permanent changes that you're creating. And that said, there are people that are trying to capture that CO2 that's released during fermentation and make it inert or turn it into chalk or something like that. And I've, I think that that's an interesting thing to think about or to at least acknowledge. And, and um, like Chris Figgins is saying, we have an opportunity to sequester it. Mm-hmm. 